third and final presentation just in this quarter's award-winning Teachers on Teaching series. There will be two more talks next quarter, both in May, so we hope you will join us for those. Right now, though, we feel very fortunate to have not just one, but a pair of very distinguished scholar teachers, Professor, Professor Joshua or Josh Landy from French and Italian, and Professor R. Lanier Anderson from Philosophy, who are going to talk to us very appropriately on team teaching. Now, those of you who have been to these talks before know that I usually start them off with a brief academic bio of the presenter. And since Lanier had presented in the series already on his own, I did have a ready-made bio of him. And all I had to do was write something about Josh. But I decided that I really should, in the spirit of the presentation on teen teaching that they were doing, I should try to do an integrated introduction. And so here goes. Professors Josh Landy and Lemir Anderson are two stars in the Younger Humanities faculty firmament at Stanford and uh, across the country. They completed BAs one year apart. Lanier in 1987, summa cum laude in philosophy from Yale, and Josh in 1988 in French and German with first class honors from Churchill College in Cambridge University. <laughs> Josh was first to finish an MA from Cambridge in 1991, <laughs> uh, Lanier completing his in 1993 from Penn, but Lanier managed to finish his PhD, also from Penn, in philosophy that same year. Josh completed his PhD in Complet from Princeton in 1997. They arrived at Stanford in the same year, 1996, pursuing paths that could have been competitive, as I was somewhat playfully hinting at. But instead, they have converged in wonderfully productive ways for their students, for their colleagues and for Stanford. With shared interests in philosophy and literature and in the interplay between the two, they have developed the program in philosophical and literary thought, a rich addition to Stanford. Both have also already done an unusual amount of university service and yet have compiled stellar teaching records. Josh won the Gores Award for Excellence in Teaching, a university-wide award in 1999 and Lanier won it in 2002, the same year he was also chosen as class day lecturer. Josh won the H&S Dean's Award for Distinguished Teaching in 2001 and Lanier in 2004. But make no mistake, both are above all scholars of note who have won coveted fellowships at the Humanities Center, Josh in 1999-2000, and Lanier in 2000-2001, and both have published in the learning journals, in the leading journals, which we also hope are learning journals, <laughs> of their field. Josh writes on Proust, Lanier on Nietzsche and Kant, though both are ultimately concerned with larger questions regarding the meaning of human existence. They can make academic life look easy, but instead they make it look fun, rewarding, and warmly collegial. I give you Professors Anderson and Landy. And I give Josh Landy the microphone. Okay. Let's see. Is this mic working to your satisfaction? You, you need to speak up. It? Well, I'll I'll speak up. I'm just trying. To, okay. Ah, okay, so it's being adjusted. That's great. Well, well, thanks a lot. Um, the, this introduction is embarrassing, and it makes it um, even worse to be here. Um, <laughs> it, of course, it's great to be here, but it's daunting to be here. Um, you know, it says award-winning teachers on teaching, so you probably expect us to know some things. Um, and that's a problematic assumption. But um, we do at least have a lot of experience in teen teaching. I, I disclaim, uh, at least on my part, any actual knowledge. Feel free um, to disclaim for me too. But <laughs> we are recidivists 
and we have done a lot of uh, repeat offending in team teaching. Um, I've taught Paul Iham numerous occasions, once with Lanier, um, Spring Iham in French and Italian. I, I was looking over my CV, 2001, 2, 3, 4, 5, and now this year, each time with a different um, partner. Uh, Lanier and I have taught together a philosophy and literature seminar, both at the undergraduate level and the graduate level. So uh, we've done this a bit. Um, and the following is going to be a series of bits of advice, um, which may or may not be helpful, may or may not be true. And there's not really a philosophy behind it, or not much of a philosophy behind it. But um, here it is for what it's worth. And it will be in the following five blurry segments. Uh, well, I'm sure there's a focus on it. Um, if no one else wishes to play with it. But maybe it's that. OK, thank you. Um, two things to bear in mind um, before I launch into the various bits of advice. First, um, our experience is primarily, in, well, is solely in the humanities. Um, and we, of course, would like to think that similar uh, considerations apply in team teaching and in the sciences, but we don't know. Um, so we just hope that some of these ideas can be useful uh, outside the humanities. Secondly, um, we'll be talking about big lecture courses and about seminars. And I'll try sometimes to keep them separate, but I may not always succeed. Um, but this is, a, you know, this is an amalgam of thoughts about strategies both for big lecture courses like IHUM, uh, but also for smaller seminars like the, the philosophy and literature seminar that Lanier and I taught. Um, let me start by asking you guys a question, uh, which is something that I often do. Um, frees me up from all my responsibilities. Uh, <coughs> I'm, I'm assuming and hoping that some of you are here because you have interest in team teaching. So why? What, in your view, might be some commanding reasons to want to get involved in team teaching? Someone has an expertise that might complement yours and help the course. Uh, other reasons? Don't be shy. Yes. We can share our ideas together and put it in the uh, course. We can share our ideas together with our uh, colleagues. Yeah, so you get to share your ideas together with your colleagues. Yes. It, it's much more interesting for those whoever you're teaching and much more dynamic. Right, so it's so for the students too. It's more interesting, more dynamic. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Might be fun, <laughs> right? You get along with somebody you want to teach with them. Um, which of oh uh, yes, you. It's half the work, isn't it? Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, we don't like to say that any anything is wrong, but that's wrong. <laughs> mechanism that constantly drives you to improve your teaching because you've got somebody else watching you and you talk about it afterwards. Right. And this of course also a reason not to do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll get to that. Um, right. So yeah, you're driven to, to higher performance, right? Because you have someone there who is going to tell you when you're wrong. And that, I think it's a powerful uh, reason for doing it. Which one of these reasons is the correct reason? <laughs> right. Half the um, <laughs> Half the teacher. Um, the, I, I, I raise this question partly because I genuinely, want, genuinely wanted to know what you think, but also partly because one of my uh, bugbearers in teaching, or if you like, one of, to put more positively, uh, one of my you know, hobby horses is the question, uh, the open question. And so and one of the things I'll come back to a bit later on is, um, at least in the seminar situation, but also in lecture, I think, the capacity to ask a question that is susceptible of multiple answers, multiple interesting answers, is a very powerful one um, and also extremely hard to do. Um, it's one of the hardest things you could, you can, the hardest parts of your preparation, I think, um, but also the, one of the most valuable. So steer my advice is steer in the direction of the first question that I asked and away from the second question that I asked. 
even though it's tempting always to ask questions to which you know uh, the answer. So a um, series of random thoughts, hopefully uh, not as random as they appear, um, in this order, which is a sort of chronological order of how you might get into um, team teaching. Firstly, well, you, maybe you should decide whether you want to do it at all. Um, and we've heard some great reasons for doing it. Um, I bracket them in general under two headings. Uh, first, to teach in a different way, and second, to learn in a different way. And we've heard both of these, right? So it's fun for your students, but it's also really good uh, for you. Under the first rubric, I just point out that what happens in a team talk class is not just that you get more material. So it's not just that, well, look, I mean, we, we get to present some philosophy in here and some literature in here, so it's sort of two courses for the price of one. But um, it's that you're modeling different approaches to a particular object of study. So it's not just more objects of study. It's uh, more angles. Um, so you get to model different approaches. You get to model uh, high-level debate among experts. You get to show students what the range is of permissible disagreement. Right? So uh, here, here's a case where um, two uh, equally competent people might legitimately disagree, be able to bring reasons and arguments to bear for disagreement. It's neither the case that one of them is wrong, nor the case that anything goes. These are the sort of Scylla and Charybdis um, of the you know, undergraduate uh, attitude towards at least certain segments of the humanities. Right? Um, so here is a case where you can really show by example uh, what kinds of questions are susceptible of these beautiful, um, this, this beautiful openness, that there are four or five possible approaches, neither of which really commands a privileged uh, right to our attention, uh, but others are excluded. For example, Lanier's idea that it's half the work. <laughs> I, we rule that out. Right? It's not the case that anything goes. Everything has to be argued for, but it's also not the case that there's just one uh, monolithic approach. And all of this, I think, is in the service of a different kind of communication. You can communicate facts, but here's one thing that I love about the English language, you can also communicate momentum. You can think about the word communicate in a completely different way. Um, that we're not merely filling our students' heads with data. Instead, we're, ins we're trying to inspire them. Because you know this from your own experience. 90% of what you learn, you learn on your own. Even if it's the same stuff that you're being taught in, in lecture or in other contexts. Uh, you learn it by uh, assimilating it, appropriating it, reproducing it. So our job is not so much, I think, to deliver that information as to instill in students the desire to want to get it. Uh, so it's a communication, I think, of momentum in addition to, and more importantly than, uh, a communication of information that all of this is in the service of. So you're teaching in a different way. You're not teaching just different stuff, but you're teaching using different approaches, even different styles. Right? You learn each, from each other's style. I mean, I learned one of the most important things that I know about teaching. No, right? <laughs> quotation mark. Uh, from this gentleman, um, which is that when you're reproducing somebody's argument, it's really nice to say what the advantages of that argument and he always, he doesn't merely content himself with saying, okay, so so-and-so says A, B, C, D, E, and F. Um, and that is a real problem with E. Which is what I've tended to do very often. Um, but what he'll say is, it's A, B, C, D, E, and F. And here's why you might want to think that. Here's what that, having that kind of uh, belief about the problem can do for you. And no wonder many people have found this interesting. But at the same time, well, there is this problem with E. <laughs> Uh, so I've learned from teaching the Lear something just about teaching style. And this is, again, something I think we stand to gain. We raise our game, absolutely. Uh, we have fun with people we want to, to teach with. Um, 
but we also can incorporate different strategies that uh, are incredibly effective and maybe we didn't uh, think of ourselves. We learn a different way, too. Oh, yeah, yes. Linda so Anderson. before you do that, let me just say I wanted to add another thing about, about modeling different approaches. Um, I think this is especially important if you're, as Josh and I are in, in, in the courses that we've been team teaching together in the philosophy and literature program, if you're trying to prepare students for interdisciplinary work themselves, then you really need to uh, pay attention to modeling for the students what the disciplinary what the disciplinary approaches are because what we're trying to get our students to do in interdisciplinary work is to be able to come from both uh, from the strengths of both disciplinary perspectives um, and to uh, step from one to the other and team teaching gives us an opportunity to come together in a group where you have uh, already an advanced scholar in each discipline who can model the uh, characteristic standards and assumptions of that discipline and also model what it is that, um, in the views of the teaching team, uh, are good and interesting ways for somebody who's in one discipline to take up insights uh, from the body of knowledge of another discipline. Thanks. Um, no, and I, you know, thanks for the contribution from your end of the discipline. Um, <laughs> uh, by the way, you know, I should point out that, as is probably obvious, um, my role today is to read from these notes, um, which appear to be have been written by me, but of course, many of them, including this sentence, were written by Lanier. Um, <laughs> and his role is to kibitz. Um, <laughs> And uh, I'll say this point now, even though officially it comes under how to teach your course. Uh, but in the seminar setting, have somebody sitting in the middle. Uh, it really encourages a kind of crossfire and a sense that uh, people are all equal participants in the, the process. Um, OK, so uh, teaching in a different way and learning in a different way, right? So this opportunity, yeah, to raise your game, be challenged. Uh, have your intellectual world enriched with a whole new set of questions. Um, all of these are very good reasons to do it. What are reasons not to do it? Um, it's hard work. Lanier uh, uh, flippantly claimed, uh, ironically claimed it was hard work. This is a common misperception. It's not. It's at least three quarters of the work, if not all of the work. Um, and if you come in thinking it's going to be an easy ride, the course will fail, and it will have been your fault. <laughs> um, so warning, people will not be happy. Um, uh, two more reasons. One, it's a little harder to keep things under control. Uh, you will have two or maybe three people, each of whom have their own separate agendas. That's the point. But at the same time, you're going to have to keep things within some kind of overarching framework. Have your course still tell some kind of coherent story that the students can, you know, so the students will have a framework uh, within which to put all of the different experiences. Finally, um, this is something I'll come back to, it's harder to have other people speak. If there are two or three of you talking, it's going to be that much harder to involve the students. So you have to do more work uh, to make that possible. All right, let's say you've decided, in spite of these warnings, that you really want to do it, and I think you should. Well, uh, how do you create your team? Um, this gets back to something you were saying, pick people you really want to work with. Um, I, you know, I'm not going to pursue the marriage analogy because it gets one to very murky waters. But uh, suffice it to say, you're going to be working with whoever is in your team for quite a while. Uh, not only during the quarter, but you know, before when, you're, uh, when you are uh, setting up the course uh, and after when you're doing all your post-mortems. So um, you better like them and respect them. Uh, and want to learn from them. How much should you agree with them? That's an interesting question. I think you should agree enough, but not too much. And that's a statement which, of course, is empty. Um, so you're going to have to work that out for yourself. But let me just say one thing to fill it in. Uh, Lanier and I, I think, agree too much. We still work together, but we have to sort of force the points of uh, antithesis, where the, where the questions are, 
are still live and interesting. And sometimes we have to retrench to earlier positions, which we've surrendered by virtue of having taught together so long. <laughs> uh, so you know, we, it, it's worked, right? Uh, we've definitely learned so much from each other that we have to work harder to keep uh, the oppositions clean. Um, but you can also pick somebody to work with who you're pretty confident is going to disagree. And there was a one year of IHAM when Lanier and I talked together with our colleague and friend, Rush Rem. And we chose him uh, partly because we like him, um, and we get on with him, and we respect him, but also partly because we knew he was going to trash us. <laughs> uh, we were going to say all this stuff about self-fashioning and perfectionism and individual aspirations, and he was going to say, this is decadence and you are fiddling while Rome burns. You are bad people. <laughs> and this, of course, this is a sneaking suspicion that we have about ourselves, right? So it's not that, I mean, on the one hand, we're going to disagree with him, we're going to push for our point of view, but we respect that position. Uh, so you can choose somebody on the grounds of a, a difference, of a, a very important, fundamental difference, a difference about value. Let's say you've made your team. How do you plan your course? Um, well, hard. Plan a lot. Plan early and often. Um, what should you do? Set your objectives ahead of time. Figure out what it is that you actually want to accomplish with this course, both for yourselves and for the students. Assign duties, if possible. Um, I'm going to pretend for the sake of this talk that Lanier and I officially assign duties <laughs> to ourselves. I think maybe from now on we can. Um, <laughs> and those would have been, I'm, you know, I'm the coursework uh, site manager, and he's the a drafter of the assignments. I mean, so that's you know, one example. Um, uh, but most importantly, co-design everything in the course. You have to get, everyone in the team has to be behind every element of the course. Rule of thumb is, if somebody asks you what is object X doing on the syllabus, and you can only answer, it's there because Y wanted it, <laughs> then you failed. Um, you, need to ha you need to stand behind every element on the course, even if it's because you hate it. It sort of is an analogous point to the, uh, well, analogous, but I take out the word hate, um, to the point about teaching with someone you disagree with. Um, Lanier and I uh, decided that we would teach the film Adaptation um, by uh, Charlie Kaufman, if you guys know this movie, um, in part because I love it, but in part because Lanier thinks it's morally reprehensible. <laughs> it's not just a bad film in the sense of aesthetically bad film, it's a bad film in the sense of a morally bad film. And this made for a very interesting uh, teaching experience. <laughs> Did you want to say something about this? The people who like it are bad people. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, anything else about planning that you want to add? Uh, I think a key thing is um, that with your other team members, you really have to trust where they're going to take the students. Um, you need to have some kind of, um, you need to to talk with them enough so that you have an understanding of their understanding of their own field and yours so that nobody has bad surprises about, um, about uh, sort of what the basic assumptions behind the course are supposed to be. In particular, if you, I mean, it's tempting sometimes um, to take the idea of team teaching with somebody you disagree with a little too far if you disagree about what the students are supposed to learn and what the field is about, then yeah, yeah, you can mount a disagreement and the students can witness that, but then it isn't any longer a course, it's kind of a meta course about what this course should have been about, and then nobody <laughs> learns anything. So you need, to, um, you need to get at least that amount of trust beforehand um, and that's why I think it's such a good rule of thumb, this thing Josh said about the syllabus, that you always have to, you, know, you can test yourself that way. You always have to have a better answer than because Josh wanted it. <laughs> okay, so um, logistics, and then we'll talk about
how to teach your course, which is the bulk of what um, I have to say. Um, well, two things about logistics. One, meetings. Two, grading. Uh, it's vital to have regular meetings. Uh, and everyone should attend, uh, if possible, on all occasions. This is because uh, you have everyone pulling in these different directions, and as I was saying before, and you need to keep a coherence in the course. So you kind of need to keep testing the pulse uh, of the course. You want there to be a certain principle of openness. You want it to be possible for things to just leap out and surprise you. And part of, I think, the, the great boon of team teaching is, is that, is that you're hoping not to have everything figured out in advance. You're hoping that you'll serve as catalysts for a reaction whose consequences are somewhat unpredictable. So you have to leave things somewhat open. But then, in order to correct for that, uh, you're going to need to meet regularly and uh, plan out how you're going to nonetheless reassure your students that, in fact, there is still a, a line around which you're drawing this, this arabesque. Um, on grading, this is, a, this is a very important issue. Uh, you'd better find some way of having uh, mutually agreed upon standards. And it's best, I think, to be as explicit as you can about how you want to grade. In our case, you might find disagreements about grading, uh, about grading strategies in relation to the balance of brilliant ideas and solid argumentation. So is it an A if there's a brilliant idea and it's all over the place? Is it an A if it's a solid, argument, a solid argument but not that inspired? Um, do you need a bit of both? You better get that sorted out. And something else which we didn't quite realize until we started doing this is uh, grading standards differ from department to department. <laughs> Let me phrase it this way. I am very envious of the philosophy department because they get to give people C's. They have the full range of grades. <laughs> We have, you know, you think that's the full range. <laughs> used to be the full range included D, right. Um, yeah, so uh, given that that's the case, and it's not the case for us, well, you know, some, one of you is maybe going to have to go up, and one of you is going to have to go down, and uh, it's vital that you keep on the, you know, that the, the, whoever's grading the paper is grading it in the same way as everybody else. So have grade norming meetings. Just make sure that students don't end up with the impression that it's really good to turn in your paper to Linear Anderson. <laughs> You'll get a, well, I guess in this case, no, to me, right? Because you might get a, gray, a C from him. Um, so, so that's, say, uh, yeah. Can I say yeah. something about that? Go ahead, please. Um, I mean, it's hard to get the grade norming right. And if you cross disciplines, it becomes, it's hard anyway. And if you cross disciplines, it becomes even harder. But I don't want to leave you with the thought that this is this huge uh, insuperable problem, that too is an opportunity where you really can learn something interesting about your own teaching from team teaching with other people. Because of teaching with Joshua and especially because of uh, teaching with TAs from the division, uh, from the literature departments, I really understand much more explicitly what the grading standards are that I think are important and why. Because I was forced in these grade norming meetings, which were longer than the usual ones, um, <laughs> to articulate exactly why I thought this was the appropriate grade for that paper and this other thing must be wrong with this paper. And you know, there, within disciplines, we have shortcuts that we use with each other. And in a grade norming meeting, even in a large course, in your own discipline, you use those shortcuts to shorten the meeting, and therefore you don't achieve full explicitness about what your expectations are. So I found that because we achieved fuller explicitness than usual, we were also able to give better guidance to our students about what they should be doing. Yeah. And yeah, another way of, that's a great point. I mean, another way of thinking about that is that ultimately, here are my 10 commandments for your, uh, to your amusement, I suppose. Um, <laughs> is that you know, you're, you're training your students, presumably, to do something interdisciplinary. And if they're going to do excellent dis interdisciplinary work, they're going to have to meet the standards of both disciplines. Um, so somebody who's going to write a paper on philosophy and literature is going to have to be philosophical enough and literary enough. So I think it's, yeah, it's 
especially vital so that we understand what our, uh, our uh, expectations are, so that we can communicate that to the students, and they will become uh, excellent scholars. Um, so yeah, Ten Commandments. I'm sort of kind of, I've talked to us about some of these, and I'll come to the rest now. Um, right, so so far, uh, what I've been talking about is the benefits of team teaching, dangers of team teaching, uh, danger of you know, confusing your students when it goes badly, um, silencing your students, um, ways of picking your team, try to find the right balance of agreement and disagreement, co-design everything, get behind everything, uh, confer as often and as early as possible, um, and especially get your grading uh, lined up. What about the actual conduct of the course? I have, it seems to me, 12 points, so bear with me. Um, most of them are short. Point one, attend all sections, all meetings of the class. This is the single most important thing that I probably have to say. Um, never miss a colleague's lecture. Uh, if a colleague is leading discussion or seminar, same thing, be there. Um, if you're teaching a class that is five weeks you and five weeks somebody else, that's not a team talk class. That's two classes. That's just two five-week classes. And that's not going to achieve um, the aim. So yeah, show up. That's, that's rule one. Um, rule two. If it's a seminar, plan what you're going to do ahead of each mm -hmm. class. Um, assign responsibilities. So here, I'm the speaker, and Lanier is the kibitzer. Um, uh, and if it's, even if you're not the one who is officially in charge, have something to say. Have some view about the material. Uh, it may not come round to you, conceivably, but uh, your responsibility is to be ready, to have some kind of thing that you might conceivably want to say. Point three, if it's a lecture course, write really good lectures. Um, you have fewer of them. So this gets back to the, is it half the work? Well, sort of. You'll have half the number of lectures. But then that gives you the uh, freedom, and indeed, I think, the responsibility to write better ones. And here is my single um, most uh, important, in my view, piece of advice in this regard. Never end a lecture with the phrase, We'll talk more about that on Wednesday. <laughs> so you know, try, if at all possible, to have some kind of rousing finale, ideally reminding the students of what this whole hour was for. Right? So there was some reason why it was worth you preparing this stuff and worth them being there. And with that, uh, and by reminding them, this is why we're here. So, I mean, I think this is one of the main areas in which your point really comes to the fore. You know, you're, you give these lectures or lead these discussions in front of a respected colleague, and it does raise your game, um, and sometimes quite dramatically so. So the, the first time uh, I team taught in a small class at Stanford, I, I team taught, when I first came out to Stanford, I was just appointed on a one-year visiting job, and... I was being considered for a permanent job in the department. And I team taught the critique of pure reason with the chair of the search committee. And this, um, this did have a tendency to you know, make you prepare harder. <laughs> and so I, I try to live up to that uh, level of panic whenever I'm going to be presenting my ideas in front of Joshua, um, although I don't always uh, get quite the same uh, stress level. Um, but it, it is, that's a, that's a, you can, that's a case of uh, uh, emotional distress that you can use for the advantage of yourself and your students um, because you really do, it's, you know, it's embarrassing not to have as good a lecture as you should in front of somebody who is in a position to judge. What is that line, nothing like being, sort of being hanged in the morning to concentrate the mind? <laughs> <laughs> or Indeed. not being hired? Um, point four, uh, very brief point, in your lecture, cite the other person. Um, point five, 
um, sometimes cite the other person to disagree with him or her. Uh, so, you know, I think there's a balance there again, no idea how to quantify. Um, but I'm sure you will find that balance where you're saying, you know, as, as Professor, Professor Anderson was saying last time, so and so and so and so, of course, we couldn't possibly follow him all the way to the conclusions that he so spuriously yeah. reached, and here's evidence <laughs> why we should. Um, so argue against and deploy evidence. And, um, and use evidence that is emblematic of the way in which you do things in your discipline. Uh, model intellectual work from where you come from. Um, show people what it's about. And maybe even make it explicit. You can say, well, you know, the, Lanier, of course, was arguing about this as a philosopher. But, you know, he's missing this vital dimension. So I will come in and say, um, here's a bit of Plato's dialogue. You might, of course, the following philosophical arguments here, but what about the irony between the author and the character? Isn't this important? Why is that being missed out? Yes, but what are the arguments of the characters? And uh, you better reconstruct them and make sure that you understand the logical relations among these premises. Otherwise, you'll never understand what uh, is pretended to be said by this or that character. Very, very nice comeback. Um, <laughs> You can, I, I, I mean, I, you know, I don't, maybe this won't appeal to all of you, but um, you can push it sometimes to the point of caricature. Um, there, I always say that the philosophers think that we literary folk are flaky, and we think they're dry, and we're both That's right. right. <laughs> um, and we, you know, you can point to their dryness, and they can point to your flakiness, but you can also point to your flakiness. So you can talk about the way in which those French theorists do things and uh, you know, maybe why they shouldn't. Um, so you can make certain things uh, explicit about um, the other person's discipline or your own. Um, okay, this what is, is, let, me, let me add this one ahead. last thing. I mean, this is one of the places where if you team teach a lot together, you do start to have to go back to staging the disagreements that you had when you started out. Because after a while, you know, I mean, he's a very persuasive man. I start to get convinced. <laughs> I modify my view, he modifies his view, and pretty soon there's no disagreement left for the students to, to see and to come to understand. And so uh, we do end up having to do some acting and pretending to still believe things that we used to believe when we started out on the enterprise together. Yeah. But luckily there's still enough uh, issues on which he's wrong. <laughs> right? uh, well, you know the example I'm thinking. Um, all right, so that was, that was six. Seven is, um, and this is a, a phrasing I learned from taking improvised theater classes. Not that that's relevant to anything. But the, the phrase is, make your partner look good. Um, I don't think anyone here really thinks this. But just in, in case, I, so I don't, so this is probably a straw man that I'm attacking. Don't think that it's a zero-sum game where uh, the students are going to fall in love with one professor at the expense of the other or others. Um, it doesn't work that way. And that's a nice thing, a nice feature about team teaching. Uh, in my experience, at least, what happens is that if everyone is performing well, yeah, so if, if, if the other person is performing well, the students are going to pay more attention to your lecture because the course is going to be more successful. They're just going to be more engaged. So there's actually a premium, rather, you know, again, I don't think anyone really thinks this, but um, just a way of putting the point. Rather than thinking, well, you know, I'm going to stand out because those other lectures were so bad, um, do whatever you can to help if ever such a situation arises. And one did arise for us um, in our class last quarter. Um, I happen to know that Lanier has this brilliant argument about Jane Austen. And I know exactly what it is. Indeed, that's the only reason we read Jane Austen, because <laughs> otherwise you would have forbidden it. No, but, <laughs> but I got behind it yes. because I knew I could argue against you, <laughs> even though it's a brilliant argument. Anyway, the point of this, this story is that um, Lanier is there putting his case, but building it very carefully, as one always does, and it, you know, keep Students, of course, kept coming in and, and introducing new ideas and asking questions, again, as one wants. But the effect of this was that he forgot to make the big point. 
so we, you know, it was two minutes to the hour, and um, it was not going to get made. <laughs> so I just said, and that, this is where you introduce your brilliant argument that. <laughs> Um, yeah, this is, I, mean, I don't say this to toot my own horn. I mean, the point is, you know, just uh, if there, th there will sometimes be moments when you can help the course by making, making each other look good in that um, wonderful jargon. Um, that's a, uh, what was that, 0.7, 0.8? Um, yeah, consider the spatial layout in a seminar. So, yeah, stick him down there um, or vice versa. So you'll be among the students rather than having this, Weird thing of having a you know two-headed um, president or whatever. Uh, 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 let the student speak. That's a vital point. That's even thou shalt let thy student speak. Um, little allusion to Exodus. Um, how do you do that? Uh, various ways, and if, you know you've heard no doubt many suggestions from different lectures in this series. Um, uh, uh, open questions are my favorite strategy. Even in big lectures, I'll ask an open question, see what comes back. Um, don't necessarily have a, an answer plan. Maybe you have one, but maybe you're willing to accept some of the others in addition and see how they rub up against uh, your favorite idea. What I've noticed about Stanford undergrads is a, kind of a scary thing, which is they are far smarter than we were <laughs> at their age. I mean, streets ahead. I teach IHOM a lot, and you'll have these uh, fora for, for student contribution and questions, and they'll ask things about the marketplace of ideas. Or you'll, you know, you'll say, anyone know uh, what the diet of worms is? And yes, somebody will know, right? I mean, there's a, there's a line in Hamlet, uh, your worm is the only emperor for diet. I asked, does this remind anybody of anything? Thinking, no, of course not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, diet of worms. Yes, what's that? Well, it was the thing with Luther. <laughs> uh, I am infinitely impressed. So, you know, let that happen. Let the students show how much superior to us they are. Um, and don't keep them out. That's a kind of a negative way of phrasing the same, same point. Don't keep them out by being too technical. You might be tempted into having high-level debate with your friend and colleague. And no doubt we do this a lot more than we should. But try to um, police yourself and keep things at the level where the students currently are. So another thing that I think is important about that is that it's important to set a tone from the very beginning of the course that student contributions are going to be valued and indeed expected. Um, and so it's, it's good in the first few meetings to set up a pattern in which people do intervene in the discussion from all kinds of angles. And one thing that Josh and I did um, in the graduate interdisciplinary seminar that we taught on philosophy and literature was um, to start out the first day with a little game in which we forced the students to self-identify as literary critics or philosophers. And um, then we played this little game where the idea was for each group to come up with technical terms that they thought the other people needed to know and didn't. and then. Uh, there was a game in which you had to guess the meanings of those terms, and people got points. And you know, it really it started off the discussion in the course, even though it was just a little trick, and it was about um, a, a purely formal sort of subject. It was information that was useful for the students to have, and at the same time, it got them used to the feeling that they really had to contribute to make the seminar work. Right. Yeah. And there, you know, that's just one little idea, but there are a thousand different ways to get the discussion started early. If you start out by lecturing and hope that you'll lay out a whole groundwork for them and then they can talk, uh, they will, what they will have learned by week four is that they don't have to say anything in class. And or that they're not welcome to. Mm -hmm. I think that's absolutely, I mean, whatever you do at the beginning is going to set the trend. I agree completely. Uh, I wish I could disagree more with Lanier to model that, but I can't. Um, <laughs> I guess it goes back to my earlier confession of our weakness. This is a lot, the last point, basically. Um, uh, again, going back to the kinds of questions you can uh, ask these open questions, but ask some questions to which you really have no idea of an answer. Um, 
again, think of this experience as in part an opportunity to create the possibility for surprise. So that's the last commandment. Um, it's one of the great things. Of course, it could go horribly wrong. Right? You could ask a question, you don't know the answer. Nobody knows the answer. And you just have to move on. But you might be surprised. Um, one way of thinking about uh, uh, these courses is, or your, one's, one's own investment in these courses is as a catalyst. That you're not, you're not always um, the driving force behind everything that happens. This was the case for us in the last session, which was just a, hor a horribly risky thing. I was very intimidated of our philosophy and literature seminar this year, Lanier said, OK, we're going to do Montaigne's uh, uh, on repentance essay and Kundera's ignorance. And these are two explorations of one's relationship to one's past. And we're just going to read them both and see what happens. <laughs> and uh, I thought that yeah, these are both great texts, but I had no idea what was going to happen. But that's the point. Um, it turned out. You know, I, this is why I get to tell this story. <laughs> it has a happy ending. Um, that it was an extraordinarily fruitful discussion, and a lot of people end up writing about ignorance. And uh, so these can be just the best uh, moments in the course. So let me add one more point there. So suppose you don't know the answer, and nobody else comes up with anything good, and you don't come up with, any, come up with anything good in the course of the hour. Well. In, in one way, that's, that's another part of what it's about. So part of what we can model and part of what we have a special chance to model in the case of team teaching is um, it's a chance to take students out to the edge, to the leading edge of knowledge where we don't know what we're talking about and uh, get them to see what it's like. So there's a lot of risk in that. You have to you have to have brought them along far enough so that they actually know the difference between questions where they don't know the answer and questions where we don't know the answer, um, where we, in the, in the sense of the larger uh, community of, of scholars, don't know the answer. But, um, but it is part of our job as educators to get them to see what the production of knowledge is really like. And that means modeling inquiry where you don't know the answer and where uh, it's not the case that uh, the professor knows the answer and you're just trying to get up to speed. It's the case that no one knows the answer and uh, we have to still work on the problem. So sometimes that is a good thing to do and it turns out that something good came out of that session. But if nothing good had come out of that session, then uh, I would have said at the end, you see how hard this is. <laughs> and that would have been a good lesson. And that brings me to the very, really, very last thing. Get out of the way. Get out of the way. I mean, so, I mean, one's tempted to be the oracle and the charismatic leader, and I have all these great things to say, and thou shalt take other classes from me, but that's not on there. Um, I think, and this is just my own personal opinion, um, maybe shared by my colleague, maybe not, uh, that in order to do the work of communicating momentum rather than communicating information, it's vitally important to let ourselves be wrong, let ourselves be challenged, uh, and let ourselves get into those situations where we might fail, um, where maybe no one's going to come up with an answer. Uh, get out of the way and let the thing happen. Just be a catalyst after the, after the reaction has taken place. The catalyst gets discarded. Hopefully not fired, um, <laughs> but discarded. Thanks very much. We would love to take questions. Yeah, so we can take questions. And if nobody has any questions, then we have a little, uh, a little tricked out exercise. But uh, we'd rather ask, answer questions. Right. <laughs> Do you want to come up here for that? Uh, maybe so, yeah. Yes. I have a question about the modeling process because you, you mentioned, you know, even to the point of having to go back and reconstruct disagreements that are no longer there, or in the, the latest example of getting out there where something may happen, you have no idea. 
and so it's clear from your conversation that one of the things you're doing is modeling that process for the students. Do you find that modeling it is enough, or do you also find yourselves stepping back and saying, do you see what he just did? Or, uh, you know, do, do you, how far do you break that process down, or find you need to break that process down from just the model? Some explicitness is good, um, but sometimes, um, well, so uh, the course that we have mainly been team teaching lately is uh, a survey designed to introduce students to questions at the boundary of philosophy and literature. And so there is a lot of opportunity in that context to say, okay, this is what philosophy is about. Or here is uh, an important feature of how imaginative literary texts work. Um, so, so there you do get to uh, be explicit. But they're not yet really scholars. And so they don't really care about uh, the internal dynamic of the academic world. And so I, I think it's important not to spend too much time in the course talking about, about that kind of question. And so in the IHUM context, uh, in those fall IHUM courses, I think it's, it's fruitful not really to uh, make it too explicit and make the course be about the nature of philosophy versus literature or art versus literature or something like that. You just go up there and do it and, and let them see whether they like this or, or that. But in our seminar, I think it was important to be able to say, look, um, what we're offering here is a way to think about a set of objects from two angles at once. So sometimes it was useful to say, oh, that's him coming at it from the philosophy angle. Um, and here's the advantage. I learned that from him. Uh, you might, you know, here's the reason why you might want to approach it this way. But here's what it's what it's missing. And I think, you know, here the it's a question of what the aim of the course is. In that course, we have the aim to introduce the students to these two disciplinary approaches as one of the main purposes of the course. Um, in IHUM you don't really expect that the students who leave a fall quarter IHUM will know what they would know from, teach, from having taken you know, uh, philosophy 101 or uh, English 101 or anything like that. If they want the disciplinary introduction, then they have to go to the department and take it. So if you don't have that aim, then it's good to be less explicit, I think. Other questions? you sometimes work with TAs, and certainly in the IHAM course you have teaching fellows. How do you create a team spirit with those groups? Uh, I mean, a number of things. Certainly, everything I said about your fellow faculty member goes for the TAs. They need to be involved, too. I mean, maybe they can't all endorse everything on the syllabus because it would be unwieldy to have universal consensus. But, you know, try to keep them in the loop on why, why these texts are picked, so they would have something to say. Uh, everyone's at all meetings. Um, uh, ha, you, know, you have grade norming with them. I mean, so it's, uh, ex that means simply that your team is bigger. It's not just the two of you or three of you, it's the eight of you or however many there are. And I guess I think it's, a, it's very important to have genuine buy-in from the teaching assistants and teaching fellows into what the course is about. Mm -hmm. With teaching assistants in your department, it's pretty easy to get compliance on this point. Mm -hmm. With teaching fellows in IHUM, it, it's more of a challenge, and more persuasion is required. So I'd just tell a quick story about that. I taught in, I think it was the last quarter of CIV that was ever offered at Stanford. And there was a TF, a TA back then, who did not buy the syllabus we had come up with. And I found out after the course was over that his sections had been doing a different syllabus. <laughs> and, you know, this is just, this is a catastrophe. So, you know, you got to, I mean, so with the TFs and IHUM, those are independent scholars. They're, they're postdocs. They've been hired in a national search. And, you know, you need really to persuade them that it's 
intellectually viable to, to teach this thing. And however many meanings it takes to do that, then you have to take that many meanings to do that. <laughs> Other questions? Trying to adapt this uh, to science and social science and engineering. And it seems to me that we in the outside of the humanities are not dealing with the world of ideas quite as much. We were dealing with delivering information and modes of analysis, critical analysis, rather than, it, there's, there's less originality, there's less spirit in the room for inquiry. Uh, and I'm trying to see how, well, what, what do you think about that? First, I, I want to confess, you know, I'm even more ignorant on this than everything else. <laughs> so, one just hypothesis. Um, it could be that you're dealing with an object of study that needs to be illuminated from multiple perspectives simultaneously. And maybe that's where the energy is going to come from. It's not that you and your colleague are going to have different ideas or different theories, but it might be that in order to reach the correct overarching theory, you need a contribution from this side and a contribution from that side. Um, and maybe some of the energy is going to come from, from that. But that's just a, a guess. Yeah, so one thing that I do think is a common lesson is that you know, even in a science course where you're going to just divide up the material, I still think that it's, it's genuine value added to the course for all of the lecturers to go to all of the lectures, even though that's not the standard practice. Um, I just think, you know, uh, if you were there and you heard what Professor so-and-so said about this part of the course, then you're able in your lectures to make connections to it that you wouldn't have been able to make, um, even though it's, you know, even though you're just presenting the state of knowledge and you might have talked about it with your co-teacher in advance, still, you know, you, you learn new things when you're actually preparing what you're going to put out there. And if you hear what your colleague says, then you're able to draw connections for the students across the term in a way that integrates the information more effectively for them. And I think it's, so I think it, the, the way science courses here tend to be team taught, um, there's real value added from having genuine experts in subfields come in and give, you know, lectures for two or three weeks about such and such, and then another genuine expert from a different subfield come in to do that part. That's, that's real value added, but it's a real cost if they don't go to each other's lectures, a cost to the integration of the whole course. Whether it's a cost worth paying, I mean, you know, uh, there are lots of other things to do in life. <laughs> People have to get their research done. They have to get their grants written. But it, it is a cost that should be tracked. I think. Yes? Um, how did you guys start this? How did you, did you decide to just teach an interdisciplinary class? Did, did, how did this come about? Which <laughs> answer to the question is the right? <laughs> it's a nice which, open question. Yeah, which level of detail? So. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's a reading group run by our senior colleague Zepp Gumbrecht in the Complet department. Um, and uh, I went to that reading group one time and we were discussing a text and, and it was tangentially related to something my advisor had written about. And I sort of suggested some idea that I'd learned from my advisor and Josh really sort of picked it up, and he said something, and I was like, wow, he really understands this. It took me a long time to figure that out. That's, that's pretty impressive. And so the conversation went through several more iterations, and then after the group was over, we started talking a little more. We'd never met before. We'd never met before. Turns out we have the same advisor. <laughs> I had him at one institution. Josh had him at another institution. He and had him in philosophy. I had him in complet. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's no wonder he understood. <laughs> um, so then we really started a conversation, and the conversation was fruitful for us, really from a scholarly point of view. And then on the basis of that, we thought that our students could benefit from 
having a similar kind of conversation, and we started trying to figure out whether we could uh, overcome the legacy of mistrust among our senior colleagues and actually <laughs> cooperate with each other. Oh, there was some. Let's make this. To hear how this kind of dialectical, dialogical teaching has that ever flown back into your own research, or are you now also doing research together? Because I could imagine that it opens up so many interesting questions. Well, we did. We have co-authored a paper together. Um, and every year when we teach philosophy and literature, we say, "Okay, this year we're going to write the second paper." <laughs> and we set up the syllabus. The first time we taught it, we set up the syllabus in order to write a paper about a specific thing. And, you know, the problem is we're always teaching something else at the same time. Mm -hmm. But next time. And we're, we're also not. always three writing projects behind. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other problem. Well, thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for being here. Good to see you.